it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Man with Black Horns, the sequel to The Man in Black. Part 1, The Man in White. Visitor sat inside a dingy strip club in a working class borough of the claustrophobic city. It was dark and a dirty city, a metropolis hidden in shadows even during the day. It seemed to the visitor that the city didn't even belong on this planet, perhaps even in this universe. Though populated by over 9 million people, this brooding gothic city seemed to be a stranger to the reality which the visitor was accustomed. Still, he had a mission to complete. He had a man to kill. A man which the New York law firm of J. Wyden Fisk was willing to pay 20 million in cash to see dead and buried forever. Strangely, even though his line of work brought him to every corner of the world, the visitor had never been here. Beautiful young intern who worked for the law firm, Miss Petrova, said that she originally came from this city of thieves, which teetered on the brink between prosperity and anarchy, but left with her former boyfriend when it became too dangerous for them to stay. For some reason, Petrova recommended this shithole of a nudie bar as the best place to start his hunt for this elusive and dangerous prey. Oh, um, her name wasn't Petrova. She said her real name was Quinn. I told her that my real name wasn't Poole, but Wilson. I'm not sure why I felt the need to lie twice. The visitor was a muscular man in his late thirties with wavy brown hair, pale grey eyes and five o'clock shadow. He stared at his own reflection in the mirror behind the bar, ignoring the four naked women moving listlessly and without motivation on the stage behind him. He had chiseled facial features which could have easily mistaken him as an action star of a low-budget B-rated movie. Still, though considered handsome, all that the man saw in the mirror was ugly. He detested how he looked, but for some reason he didn't know why. Surprisingly, the low-class strip club had bottles of $500 Blanton's Gold Edition bourbon, which was reserved for those special few customers who could afford it. The man was sipping a tumbler of bourbon while Queensryche's Eyes of a Stranger played in the background. It was late in the afternoon, about that time when the working class stiffs would be coming in to unwind with a few drinks and perhaps indulge in a little extra entertainment from one of the many tattooed dancers with the pregnancy stretch marks and cocaine habit in the back rooms, laughably known as the VIP lounge. The man wasn't dressed as one of the usual customers. Instead being dressed in a pure white business suit, which stood out like a beacon in the dark, musty bar, which smelled of sweaty vaginas and disappointment. He looked like he had money. Not pimp money or drug money, but actual money earned legitimately. Still, the man ignored all of the dancers who approached him, rubbing the prime parts of their naked bodies on him while enticing him to come back with them to the VIP lounge. Now he turned them all down until they finally left him alone. Probably gay or a pedo, the woman said as they took their rotation on the stage, barely moving up and down the pole in the middle of the floor as ZZ Top's sharp-dressed man played in the background. Hey, there's a gay bar about a block from here, if no one here fits your taste, sweetheart, said the bartender. She wasn't fully naked, but she was topless, displaying her well-endowed tattooed breasts and nipples pierced with gold rings. The man smiled mirthlessly. Thanks, but I'm just here to meet someone. The man pushed his tumbler across the bar and the bartender refilled it with the expensive bourbon. And suit yourself, baby. Care to donate to the jukebox? The man in the white suit passed her a 50, which the bartender took, eyeing it as though she thought it was a fake. Anything you want to hear, baby? She said putting the 50 in her thong and pulling a 10 out of the cash register to put in the jukebox. Ah, just play what you like, he answered. Just play it loud. Soon the door opened, letting the fading late afternoon light into the dimly lit bar. A tall muscular man with wavy brown hair and pale grey eyes entered, wearing a worn dingy jacket of one of the city's many cab companies. The name of the cabbie's jacket said Jake, and the cab driver took a seat next to the man in the white suit. 
The cab driver glanced at his own reflection in the mirror, wincing slightly at what he saw. Care for a drink? said the man in white. Bourbon? I'll take a beer, the cabbie said. Bud Light? asked the man in white. Do I look like a woman to you? said the cabbie. Bartender, I'll take a Corona. The bartender was a few feet away washing glasses and seemed not to hear the cabbie. Shaggy's song, It Wasn't Me, played loudly over the speakers. The man in the white suit said, Excuse me, my friend here said he'd like a Corona. The bartender looked at him, an uncertain expression on her face. Oh, uh, sure, she answered. Looking at the man in the white suit, she saw that his tumbler of bourbon was still full, but she reached into the ice cooler and passed him a Corona anyway. The man in white took the corona and passed it to the cabbie. Okay, what have you got? The cabbie took a sip of his beer and then said, Well, this is a big city, but I don't think that you'll have a hard time finding the man with the black horns. If you ask any of the big time players in this city, that guy's nowhere and everywhere at the same time. There's a deep state underworld that secretly runs this city, sort of the same way the deep state runs the country. Well, the police commissioner seems to be on the up and up, but at least a quarter of the force are on the take. And the only thing that's keeping this city from turning into the shit show that San Francisco and Chicago have become is the guy with the black horns. And his real identity? Is the billionaire playboy secretly running around at night dressed as some kind of black bat? The cabbie shook his head. Well, no one really knows. I mean, the billionaire and the guy in the black bat costume have been seen and photographed together. But with the black bat wearing a mask, it could easily be a body double to throw people off. Well, whoever the guy is, he's extremely clever and effective. So much so that I hear that even that stupid clown criminal has left town to form a law firm up in New York. The man in the white suit shifted uncomfortably in his seat, then took a long gulp of his bourbon. Quinn said that she has very intimate knowledge that the billionaire is the target. So I'm going to go on that assumption. I need to flush out the black bat. If he is as dangerous as everyone says he is, I'll need to throw him off his game. The cabbie also took another swig of his beer. What about your other friend? You know, the billionaire with all the fancy white-colored vehicles and gadgets. Why don't you get him to help you track down the black bat? Uh, you mean Stephen? <laughs> no, said the man in white. Two billionaires in the same city with practically the same fancy helicopters, boats and vehicles. <sighs> Too suspicious. Like the US and Russia, two biggest bullies on the block are sure to notice each other. Oh, if the billionaire playboy really is the black bat, another billionaire coming to town with a white-colored version of his black-colored shit would be like a signal beacon to the black bat screaming, I'm coming to get you. So, how do you plan to handle this one then? replied the cabbie. Now, from what I understand, this guy will probably be the most dangerous target you'll face, even though he's also physically the weakest. Why else would they be paying you 20 million to take him out? That's far more than what they paid you to off the Thunder God. The Thunder God? said the man in white, chuckling. <sighs> he was easy. Yeah, even easier than offing the kid who thought he was some kind of man spider. That so-called Thunder God was a self-loathing alcoholic. It was an easy thing to trace him to his favorite whorehouse in Vegas and slip something in his drink. And after that, all I had to do was dodge his hammer until the poison took effect. And from what I understand, the Thunder God's brother found it extremely hilarious that he was found naked and dead in a Vegas whorehouse, still sporting a wooden fence post. Well, be careful with this one, man said the cabbie. He's taken out some pretty big players, including the Boy Scout with the blue spandex and red cape. Not to mention that Black Bat has a few associates who also run around with him wearing the same gay-looking red and green colored battle suits. Really? How many sidekicks does this guy have? Currently, he has two, answered the cabbie. Although originally there were three. The original sidekick seems to have parted ways with the Black Bat and is off doing his own thing. 
Is he in a relationship with anyone? I've seen pictures of him with this uh, Greek historian. Diane, replied the cabbie, and the man in white nodded. Nah, it's strictly a platonic relationship. They seem to be business partners, nothing more. She works in Washington, D.C. and only travels here occasionally. Rumor has it that the billionaire is smitten by a woman who really fancies cats. The man in white nodded, taking a sip from his tumbler. The cabbie got up to leave. Anyway, I've got to get back to work. And I'll keep my eyes and ears open. I'll let you know if I hear anything new. Well, thanks for the beer. As the cabbie left, the man in the white suit called over to the bartender. That's going to be $106, said the bartender. 100 for the two tumblers of bourbon, 6 for the corona. The man in white handed over a $500 bill and said, Keep the change, before leaving the strip club. The cabbie had given him a lot to think about. The black bat would be too dangerous to take out right now. The boy scout in the blue spandex who wore his red underwear on the outside was probably stronger than the thunder god, and the black bat had defeated him. Well, they seemed to be on good terms now. Yeah, the man with the black horns had to have a weak spot, and to be able to kill him, that weakness had to be found and exploited. One of the naked dancers, a black woman with thick thighs, long artificial eyelashes and a wig of gold-colored hair, sauntered to the bar, looking enviously at the bartender holding the $500 bill. What was his issue? Noticing that the second tumbler was still half-filled with the expensive bourbon, the dancer picked it up and finished it off. That guy gay? I don't think so, answered the bartender, but I do know that he's probably crazy. He just spent the last ten minutes talking to himself in the mirror. Picking up the untouched corona, the bartender put the full bottle back into the cooler. Part 2 The Man in Black Too much. This was too much. At first it was his longtime butler. No, he wasn't just a butler. He was his friend, his confidant, and his only father figure since his parents had been murdered in that dark alley when he was just a boy. His butler had recently reunited with his estranged daughter Julia, and this event seemed to fill his butler with a youthful joy and excitement that he'd never seen before. Julia was home from college, spending as much time with her father as she could before the semester started again. They just finished dinner and Julie was going to treat her father by taking him to see the latest Batman movie, a grossly fictionalized Hollywood take on the life of the real Black Bat. They were riding in Julia's brand new Tesla, which she proudly boasted of paying for using her own money, despite the fact that her father pleaded with her to allow him to purchase the vehicle for her. They hadn't known of each other's existence for over 19 years, but now, well now they had a lifetime to get reacquainted. The Tesla exploded the second Julia started the vehicle. The man watched with a cold, stoic expression as the second of two caskets were being lowered into the soggy ground. He was just shy of six feet tall, with cold blue eyes and dark brown hair. Muscular and lean, he wore a black $16,000 Brioni suit which was quickly being drenched in the rain. Though he carried an umbrella, he declined to open it. He was oblivious to the rain, as well as the words which the priest was saying as the caskets were lowered into the ground. There were others in attendance, including Diana, Clark, Hal, and even Richard, but the man in black felt completely alone and empty. This wasn't the funeral of his beloved butler and his daughter. They'd been laid to rest on a hill overlooking his sprawling estate over three months ago. The man with black horns had spent weeks trying to track down the person who'd murdered his butler and his butler's daughter, scouring every grimy, corrupted inch of the city for a clue. But he'd come up empty. The man in black was considered the greatest detective on earth, and with his vast intellect and resources, he discovered and brought to justice the culprits responsible for countless bombings and assassinations around the world. But when it came to this, an event which hid him so close to home, 
he come up frustratingly short. Likewise, his associates had worked tirelessly to find the killer. But despite their uncharacteristically violent threats against the Gothic city's underground, they too came up with no answers. Then, less than two weeks ago, he received a text message from Jason saying that he'd found and battled a person that he suspected to be the murderer. I found the murderer and engaged him in combat. He's got some kind of white-coloured battle suit. He's dangerous, but I managed to hurt him. I've got him trapped in the... The text message ended there. Jason was one of the Black Bat's sidekicks, but as he grew older, Jason grew restless. He reminded the Black Bat of his first sidekick, Richard, only Jason was much more wild and untamable. He'd grown dangerous and unpredictable. Still, Jason had proven to be a very capable vigilante and crime fighter, and if he'd found the person who'd murdered his butler, the Black Bat would certainly have to be there. Jason's phone had a geolocator, and the Black Bat had tracked Jason moving in an erratic pattern within a one-mile radius for over an hour from one in the morning to two o'clock. Jason's actions clearly indicated that he'd been in some kind of highly fluid running battle, Jason's movement suddenly stopped atop the roof of a dilapidated ghetto building, where he remained stationary for about another hour. It was here the Black Bat and his new sidekick, a college-aged female named Carrie, arrived. Carrie sported short, light brown hair and oversized amber-colored glasses in place of the traditional black mask donned by the Black Bat sidekicks, but kept the traditional red and green colored battle suits complete with the yellow cape. The pair arrived on location in a black, bat-shaped stealth aircraft with hover capabilities, the two heroes then leaping from the jet to the roof of the building. Though the black bat had several sexual encounters with the much younger Carrie, he knew that Carrie was Jason's girlfriend and lover, so he was not surprised that, after they landed on the roof, Carrie ran towards Jason, calling out his name. Jason had his back turned to the two heroes, standing on the ledge of the building and staring down upon the filthy neighborhood where he'd just fought a running battle with the killer. Jason wore a gunmetal gray armored battle suit, a ruby red helmet covering his entire head. Though somewhat out of style with the rest of his ensemble, Jason also wore a tan tactical vest which had several pockets in which he carried various hand-thrown weapons. Strangely, however, tonight Jason also wore a long flowing white cape, something which he'd never worn with his battle uniform before. In fact, Jason had previously told the Black Bat that he'd never wear a cape, as he'd always thought them to be a sign of arrogance and excess within the superhero community. As the wind blew, Jason's cape fluttered in the breeze, revealing a sturdy metal rod bolted to the rooftop and extending up Jason's back. A rod which held Jason's dead body upright. Before the Black Bat could yell a warning to Carrie, the explosives which were implanted within Jason's abdominal cavity exploded. The man who was the Black Bat, the man who wore the black horns on the cowl of his black battle uniform, shut his eyes as the caskets of Jason and Carrie were lowered into the sodden ground. They were once his sidekicks, now reduced to shredded bits of flesh encased within a closed casket. Besides her head, left arm and right leg, there wasn't much left of Carrie to bury. There was practically nothing left of Jason except his head still encased within his red helmet. Rained well into the evening, finally stopping just before midnight. The brooding man sat in the darkened study of his mansion, sitting in a well-padded leather chair and staring at the dying embers in the fireplace. Diane, Kent, and the others offered to help him find the killer. This was something that the Black Bat insisted on doing alone. Besides, the League never felt the same ever since the water-breathing hero was incinerated on the Hudson River over a year ago. His killer had never been caught. Selina also offered to come by to keep him company but he wasn't interested in any company. Maybe after this was all over, but not now. The killer seemed to know who the people were that the Black Bat was close to. 
He had to stay away from everyone who was closely associated with him. Jason's killer had obviously chosen the place of battle, a one-square-mile area of a part of the city that was so run down that calling it a slum would be a compliment. The war-torn ghettos of Mogadishu were in much better shape. Here, in this dilapidated and abandoned section of decaying buildings and crumbling neighborhoods, haunted by the zombie-like, drug-addicted homeless, there were absolutely no CCTV cameras anywhere, as there was absolutely nothing of value here worth stealing. Aside from the waymakers on Jason's phone, there was no visual evidence of his battle against what the newspapers and news media were calling the hero killer. The perimeter motion sensors which surrounded his estate flashed on, a dim blinking red light above the entrance to the study alerting him that someone was approaching the main entrance of the front lobby. Activating a device embedded in his left gauntlet, a small heads-up display projected the image of three figures walking up to the entrance. They're here, he thought. Though the three could easily have entered the premises without tripping any alarms, they instead chose to approach on foot in a deliberate manner that alerted the black bat of their presence. He met them at the door, wearing his black battle suit and cape, though he kept his horned mask off. He knew two of his three visitors and worked with them extensively, though he was not nearly as close to them as he was to his butler and his two murdered associates. Good evening, doctors, said the black bat. Then, nodding to the muscular man wearing the gold feathers helmet, who had great hawk wings sprouting from his back, the black bat added, Carter, I'm glad you could make it. We came as soon as we could, said the winged hero a massive battle mace slung from a loop on his belt. I'm sorry for your loss, my friend. How can we be of assistance? said one of the doctors, a lean man with a pencil-thin moustache and a close-cropped hair wearing a large golden amulet and a lavish, flowing red cape. Though the mystic operated out of Greenwich Village in New York, it only took him a second for him to open a passageway to the billionaire's mansion in New Jersey. Follow me downstairs to the cave, where there's more privacy and security, said the black bat. I have some idea why you summoned us up here, specifically, said the other doctor, a tall man wearing a blue battle suit, a long gold-colored cape, and a golden helmet shaped like a Spartan's warrior's, which completely covered his entire head. You know, there's something odd about the killer, but I'll explain more of my suspicions once we get down to the cave. The Black Bat's cave was actually a highly sophisticated underground lair which housed a motor pool for his various black-painted combat vehicles, an armory for a myriad of debilitating though non-lethal weaponry, a wardrobe for various incarnations of his black battle suit tailored to meet specific mission parameters, as well as one of the most advanced AI computers on the planet, even rivaling the ones used by Stark Enterprises. It was here where the Black Bat solved an endless list of unsolvable cases, but now he was loath to admit that he had struck a dead end. Absolutely every method and technique that he used to figure out the identity and location of the killer was unsuccessful. And that's why, I presume, you called me and Kent to assist you? The mystic with the flowing red cape sipped the tea which the bat had made for him. That's correct, Stephen, replied the bat, a tinge of shame and defeat in his voice. Absolutely everything that I've tried has led me to a dead end. Gant, you said something earlier about something being odd about the killer. The muscular man with the giant hawk wings had removed his own winged helmet and was sipping on a coffee. Yes, I did, replied Kent. The mystic had also removed his golden helmet, so that now all four identities of the heroes were revealed. Forgive me, but... I took the liberty of using my fateful helmet to search the mystic realms, looking for clues that might identify the killer. Indeed, added the mystic named Stephen. I also traveled the astral planes to identify and locate the killer, and found my way blocked by a wall of immense power that even the all-seeing eye is blind to what's on the other side. Only a god has the power to do that, and an extremely powerful one at that. Why would a god want to hide a murderer from detection? Speculated the Black Bat. And presumably a god would have better things to do. 
unless the killer was some sort of avatar of the god, said Carter, the winged hero. I myself am the living avatar of an Egyptian entity, though I refuse to use the term god. Well, in any case, said Kent, a god may be powerful enough to hide its activities from either Stephen or me, but together we should be able to destroy the astral war it created and discover its identity. That is, after all, why you brought the two greatest mystics on earth to you. The Black Bat simply nodded. The mystics named Kent and Stephen knelt facing each other, Kent now wearing his golden helmet once again. His long, golden cape flowed as a supernatural wind began to swirl around them, though Stephen's red cape remained still. A fiery circle of flame appeared above them, within a black hole of whirling clouds spinning like a nightmarish black pool, a portal to the astral world inhabited by the gods themselves. Unseen by the black bat and the winged warrior, the astral forms of Kent and Stephen emerged from their physical bodies and leapt into the black maelstrom of swirling black clouds, Kent going first as Stephen held the portal open. As their spirits left their bodies, the physical forms of Kent and Stephen collapsed to the floor. Carter, the winged hero, gasped suddenly. What's it? What's wrong, Carter? grunted the black bat. That's never happened before. In the past, when Kent's astral body left him, he was still able to maintain his seated position. He maintained a connection between his astral spirit and his physical body. A look of sheer panic appeared on Carter's face. We need to pull them out of the astral plane. Their souls have been totally separated from their bodies. They're going to die. Suddenly, the circle of fire flared to life again. Only this time, the flames were pitch black and the musty, moldy odour like that of a crypt long decayed in a haunted swamp filled the air. The bat and the hawk watched in horror as a long bony hand reached down from the portal and snatched up the bodies of both Kent and Stephen, lifting their unconscious forms into the astral plane. We have to stop it, screamed the hawk warrior, flying up and slamming his battle mace into the skeletal wrist of the being. Their physical and astral bodies are united in the astral plane, and they die in the astral plane. They'll die in reality. The black bat hurled a half-dozen tungsten steel black blades in the shape of stylized bat, all of which struck the wrists and forearms of the giant clawed arm. A sinister cackling laughter filled the stale air as the arm lifted the bodies of the two mystical heroes into the swirling black void above, taking with it Kent and Stephen, but leaving the lingering scent of death. No, yelled the black bat, quickly retrieving a gun-shaped device from his belt, which launched a length of rope towards the rapidly closing portal. However, in the blink of an eye, the portal closed and the length of rope, minus the grappling hook at the end, dropped to the floor. Impossible! That's impossible! screamed Carter, the eyes of the fearless warrior wide with genuine fear. Carter, what was that? yelled the bat. That's the brother of the Egyptian deity whom I serve. But that's impossible. The thing that took Stephen and Ken is the Egyptian deity of retribution and retaliation against evil. Like the one I serve, he's supposed to be a force for justice and order. Well, whatever it is, we have to get into the astral plane, said the bat. But we can't. It takes a mystic of tremendous power like Stephen to open a portal like that. Well, we'll find a way, damn it, yelled the bat, running into his massive armory to search for a weapon to use against a god. Stark, Reed, hell, even Luther. One of them must know how to. The man with the black horns was cut short as the circle of flame suddenly appeared above the room. Once again, it was bright and red. Kent's body fell through the portal first, his golden helmet falling from his head with a clunk as he hit the floor. Kent's blonde hair was now a wispy, thin white. He was skinny and emaciated, and his once blue eyes were now grey. His skin was white and wrinkled, the once young and lean hero now old and fragile. 
Stephen fell through the portal next, or, well, what was left of him. His blue robes and flowing velvet red cape were relatively unscathed, though they were smoking as if singed in a fire. As for Stephen himself, he was nothing but a charred skeleton which crumbled to dust as soon as his remains hit the ground. The all-seeing eye amulet which he'd worn around his neck was pierced through, as if by an unbreakable claw. It was closed, forever. The bat and the hawk warrior ran to Kent's side, kneeling next to him and carefully turning him over. The bat cradled Kent's head in his arms, the mystic hero now looking as if he were well over a hundred years old. Kent, whispered the bat as gently as he could, it's me. You're safe now. What happened to Kent? What happened, Kent? What happened to you and Stephen? It's a god, croaked Kent weakly. It was a god that protects the ghost. That's why we couldn't find him. The white ghost. That's why we couldn't find him. Who, oh, Kent? The bat persisted. Who is the white ghost? He's the avatar of an Egyptian god. The god used to be like one of us. A hero in the pantheon of Egyptian gods. But he went mad. The god went mad. Ken's voice was fading. Stephen summoned the last of his power to open a portal, just as the raving mad god tried to incinerate us. How is he? How is Stephen? God, I can't see. Ken's sightless eyes searched for the other mystic. He's, um, he's fine, my friend. Kent laughed miserably. You've never been a good liar, Bruce. Carter, Carter, are you there? Kent's life force was fading fast. I'm here. You are the key, Carter. You and the white ghost both serve Egyptian deities. The god whom you serve is still good and just. Even now he battles his brother, who's been driven insane. But the mad god is stronger, and the deity you serve will not win unless you can defeat his earthly avatar. Your god has given you the ability to locate him. Together, you and Bruce may be able to defeat this white ghost. Kent then exhaled, went limp, his sightless eyes still open, as his spirit left his body for the last time. Part 3 the White Knight versus the Black Crusader. An anguished scream of rage and sorrow echoed through the secret passageway that the man with the black horns used as the entrance into his hidden lair. Carter, the winged hero, soared through the tunnel, immense fury behind his eyes. His eagerness to confront the white ghost so great that his flight speed caused a sonic boom within the tunnel, collapsing everything behind him. The winged hero was unaware of the damage he'd caused to the Black Bat's secret entrance. All Carter knew was that he had to get into the air, to attune his senses to that of the deity which he served, then to find and kill the avatar of the Mad God. If Carter failed, then the deity which he served would fall to his insane brother. He gripped his battle mace tighter. Carter only used medieval weapons in his battle against evil. For the first time... In his many, many lifetimes, he wished he had more modern weaponry. In reality, Carter was almost as ancient as the Egyptian deity he served. He died hundreds of times in combat in the past, but every time his deity revived him to continue the fight against the forces of evil. But now, well, if his god were defeated in battle, then Carter too would also never rise from the dead to continue the crusade against darkness. Whoever this white ghost may be, Carter needed to defeat him, perhaps even kill him. Heroes never set out to kill an enemy, but this, this was different. The man with the black horns cursed bitterly. The extreme speed which Carter had exited the lair, a speed which rivaled the mutant kid with the white hair and light blue lightning speed suit, caused a sonic blast which caved in the secret entrance to his lair and damaged his high-speed black armored mobile which sat at the launch pad. Fortunately, the concealed rooftop entrance was still operational, 
and the Bat could employ his black stealth helicopter. Carter had left so quickly that the Black Bat didn't have time to attach a tracker on him. As he banked his helicopter towards the Gothic city, a terrifying thought entered the Black Bat's mind. The White Ghost, whoever he was, probably knew where he lived. He probably knew who he was, and probably knew his secret identity. He also knew who his family was, his associates, his friends. The White Ghost could have attacked him in his home at any time. So why didn't he? Obviously, it was because the White Ghost feared him. He was setting up the battlefield, the psychological battlefield, by killing his family and friends. And unfortunately, the White Ghost was winning on that front. Carter, Carter, damn it, Carter, respond. The Black Bat cursed. He broadcast his message on both League and Society channels, but only received static. The Mad God was jamming his transmissions. The Black Bat's frustrations grew at the futility of simply hovering around a filthy city of millions, trying to locate a winged hero and a hero killer dressed in white. But he had no other choice. Frantically, he flew around the city, its multicolored lights blinking in the dark like a Christmas tree honoring excess and debauchery. None of the helicopter's biometric scanners were working. The deranged entity which protected the white ghost blinding the system. Ten precious minutes passed with the black bat finding nothing. Twenty minutes passed. Thirty. Suddenly the entire cockpit of his helicopter was illuminated by a blinding light. The black bat instinctively pulled the stick to the left to get out of the beam of light the secret illuminated signal that Gordon used to send for the Bat's help when the rampant criminal element which plagued the city became too dangerous for law enforcement to handle alone. But well, it looked unusual. Something wasn't right. The man with the black horns had a sinking feeling as he pointed the nose of his helicopter towards the building from which the signal light originated. Sharp tungsten steel blades, similar to the ones that the Black Bat used, but shaped like pure white crescent moons, were impaled into Carter's wrists, ankles and shoulders, crucifying him to the burning bright illumination signal. The winged warrior's arms were up, his legs outstretched and his head was down. His golden, feathered helmet was split in half and his face was gashed as if whatever split his helmet also cut his face. One eyeball hung from his empty socket by a bloody, fibrous thread. Carter was covered in his blood. His once proud and mighty wings had been cut cleanly from his back and were laid at his feet, along with his iron mace. Carter, screamed the black bat, setting his helicopter on hover and leaping down to the rooftop. As he descended, the man with the black horns flung a sharpened blade at the power cable connecting the signal light to the generator. The light was immediately extinguished in a shower of electrical sparks. The bat ran to the once-winged hero, smoke rising from Carter's back. He saw that Carter was suffering second- and third-degree burns from the heat of the signal light as he tried to quickly pry the sharpened blades from Carter's wrists, ankles, and shoulders. If the white ghost had done this, he was skilled enough to use just enough force to pin Carter to the signal light without completely amputating the limbs. Carter, yelled the black bat as he carefully lowered the severely injured and bleeding hero. I'm going to get you to a hospital. No, said Carter, pushing him away. There's no time. The mad god has killed the deity that I serve, so I'm afraid that I won't be coming back. While I was fighting the white ghost, he said he'd already killed another person who was important to you. Where is he? He the man with the black horns. Where is the white ghost? He's... Uh, he's... Carter whispered something, and then took his last breath. The black bat knew the location which Carter whispered in his dying breath. It was a disease-ridden strip club located not far away in a seedy working-class part of the city. In actuality, the strip club was a front. The real value of the club was back in the VIP lounge, where the Gothic City's criminal elite came to party and spend their ill-gotten fortunes. Gwyn once bragged that this was the place where Mr. J first introduced her to the criminal underworld as his girlfriend. The two warriors, 
faced each other outside of the dingy strip club, the first place where the white ghost visited when he came to the gothic city. Black storm clouds formed in the distance, promising a torrent of rain coming soon. Thunder echoed miles away like the opening of an artillery barrage prior to a major battle. They stood silently at first, each in a fighting stance and ready to attack. They were roughly the same height, the same lean muscular build, and both wore utility-type belts festooned with a myriad of bladed throwing weapons. But that was where the similarities ended. The black bat was garbed in a black battle suit, a horned black mask over his face and a black cape flowing behind him. Embedded in each of his black armored gauntlets were three tungsten steel bladed spikes, a set of sharpened black sace gripped in his fists, and a stylized image of a black bat emblazoned on the chest of his battle suit. The white ghost also wore a battle suit, with a crescent moon shaped cape billowing in the wind, but his battle suit was pure white with a white cowl covering a head completely hidden behind a white mask. In one hand was gripped a pair of nunchucks. In the other, the white ghost held a steel baton. On his chest was the symbol of an Egyptian moon god. Initiating the battle, with eyes filled with anguish and rage, the black bat screamed with hatred as he lunged towards the white ghost. It was at that moment that the white ghost knew He'd already won the fight. Part 4 Death of the Man with the Black Horns The man wearing the black horns stood over the prone form of the white ghost. His knee pressed roughly against the white ghost's chest. The collar of the white ghost's damaged battle suit clutched in the black bat's fists. It was pouring rain now washing the torrents of blood from both of the warriors' battle suits. It had been a long-running battle, which caused the severe injuries and deaths of dozens of law enforcement officers and innocent bystanders. The carnage between the two warriors only ended when the two found themselves back on the same rooftop where the White Ghost crucified the Hawk Warrior earlier, and the Black Bat finally broke the White Ghost's back using the fallen Hawk Warrior's iron-spiked mace. Now paralyzed from the waist down, the hero killer was at the mercy of the man with black horns. Who are you? Why did you attack my family, my friends? Answer me, damn you. Lightning and thunder cracked in the black, tumultuous skies, mirroring the dark mood of the black-garbed warrior. Behind the white cowl that covered his face, the white ghost laughed, a growing red splotch of blood staining the cowl where the corner of his mouth was. To tell you the truth, Sometimes I don't know myself. He half coughed, half laughed. Folks know me by a bunch of names. Poole, Wilson, Slade, Wade, Lawton, Rogers, Logan. <laughs> but none of them are me. I'm going to be totally honest with you. You're the first, last, and only person to ever defeat me. So I figure I owe it to you. I suffer from a condition called Disassociative Identity Disorder. Sometimes I identify as a cab driver. Sometimes I identify as a billionaire businessman, sort of like you. Yeah, folks like me who identify as something they're not a pretty fucked in the head. In reality, though, I'm the avatar of an ancient god, Egyptian god. Though in my opinion, he's more like an overly judgmental mother-in-law who constantly nags at me over stupid shit. Uh, I killed that god. Well, killed really isn't the right word. I separated myself from him forcefully. And that broken psychic link kind of sent Khonshu into the godly version of psychotic mental breakdown. I lost all my superpowers, but I kept the costume. Now there's only one of me in my head. The person whom I've always been. A mercenary. An assassin. Soon after I rejected Konshu, I just started killing cryptids. Wait, I mean entities with abilities considered superhuman. My name's Mark, and I'm the best at what I do. Well, till I met you. Still, if I'd have kept my superpowers, and if Birdman hadn't broken a few of my ribs with his mace, this little dance would have ended much differently. What? 
You're crazy, screamed the black bat. This is some kind of fucking joke to you. Who sent you? The clown? Oh no, this is not a joke. You want to know what the joke is? The joke is you, and the vow that you uphold which says you don't kill criminals. Instead, you turn over the criminals to the Justice Department, which has been bought and paid for by crooked politicians and folks like the law firm of J. Wyden Fisk, hoping and praying that they'll somehow do the right thing. But you know what's going to happen? I'm going to get out. You know why? It's because I kill the people that the Clintons and the Bidens and the law firm of J. Wyden Fisk want dead. Jeffrey Epstein? Heh, <laughs> that was me. And by the way, I hear that the police commissioner's daughter is quite attractive, and that she fancies herself to be a female version of you. Hmm, wonder how bulletproof she is. Hopefully more bulletproof than that female feline. <sighs> Selena? Silent Selena now. It appears that the whole cats with nine lives thing is just a myth. Yeah, I took her one and only life about two hours before I plucked Birdman's feathers and hung him out to dry. You want to know what her last words were? Tell Bruce the baby is his. The black bat's eyes went wide, mouth open in shock. Yeah, sorry about that one said the white ghost in mocking apology. If I'd known, I would have shot her cleanly through the head instead of letting her bleed out. Why? screamed the black bat, his voice cracking. Why did you shoot her and not me? Why didn't you shoot me? And the white ghost laughed. Do you really need to ask me that? I thought you were supposed to be the greatest detective in the world. He coughed again. Yes, I could have shot you, but my job was to kill you. If I'd have simply shot you, more people would have taken your place. The black bat would live on, albeit with another person wearing the black horns. No, that wouldn't do. The more that I studied you, the more I realized I could never kill you. The only way I could really kill you was to lose to you. The snap of the white ghost's neck echoed across the filthy rooftops of the stinking ghetto. The black bat looked down at the form laying at his feet, the dead man's head now facing at an impossible angle towards its back. The body of the white ghost spasmed and jerked for several seconds before it lay still. The hero killer was dead. The man in the black bat suit with the black horns shuddered uncontrollably as he studied the dead man wearing the white combat uniform with the white crescent moon-shaped cape and white cowl which covered his head, the symbol of an Egyptian moon god on his chest. The rain began falling harder as the black bat inhaled a shuddering breath before letting out an inhuman scream. Falling to his knees, he stared up into the heavens, tears streaming down his face his hands in his lap as if begging. That man, that white ghost, had murdered his beloved butler and only father figure that he had. That white ghost murdered his wards who had been trying to follow in his footsteps. Jason, Gary, they were all dead. And now Selina, the mother of his child. There was only one left, but more than likely Dick would come after him with a murderous vengeance as he had previously blamed the black bat for being the cause of the deaths of the others. For many long minutes he screamed and screamed and screamed, but any hope that there was some higher power out there coming to tell him that it was just a dream was met by the sirens of approaching cop cars on the streets below. He was right. The white ghost was right. Still on his knees, the man with the black horns began to laugh. The white ghost was right. There was no justice. There was no reprisal. And if the white ghost was right, there was no god as gods could be killed. Killed just like the black bat. He died when Selina died. He just didn't know it yet. The black bat, the man with the black horns, could not take a life intentionally, but the white ghost could. The black bat was a hero, a man of honor and integrity, 
A fool who trusted a criminal justice system run by criminals. Criminals who deserve to die. The white ghost was right. The black bat looked down at his fallen enemy, then began stripping off his own black battle uniform. The police found the body of the black bat, the man with the black horns, on the rooftop of the abandoned ghetto apartment building. He was white, muscular, mid to late thirties, with wavy brown hair, pale grey eyes. His neck was broken, yet another victim of the villain called the White Ghost, or the Hero Killer. Part 5. The Next Day The Law Offices of J. White and Fisk, New York City the man wearing the battle suit of the White Ghost glowered at the three people standing in the main office of the eighth floor of the building. He was maskless, and his jet black hair and white cape blew in the wind as he stood on the ledge of the broken window pane, looking with hate filled eyes at Mr. J. White, Mr. Fisk, and Miss Quinn. Bats, said Mr. J. White, laughing nervously. Is. is that you? You look a. Uh, Somewhat different than I remember. What is the meaning of all this? Bellowed Mr. Fisk, a bald, burly, rotund man wearing an immaculately tailored suit and holding a walking cane topped by a large diamond. If you don't depart these premises this instant, I'll have no other choice but to call law enforcement on you. Look around you, Mr. Wayne. There are cameras everywhere. You can either leave now or I can turn off the cameras and deal with you myself. I'll be leaving soon enough, the white ghost said through gritted teeth. I've just come to deliver a message. What, uh, what happened to Mr. Wilson? stuttered Miss Quinn. The white ghost glared at Miss Quinn, any intimacy or feeling he may have had for her having been drowned in a sea of fury and hatred. You owe his estate twenty million dollars, replied the white ghost his tone so deadly that Miss Quinn nearly passed out in sheer terror. But, but, but wait, protested Mr. White. How do we owe him that money when we sent him to kill the black bat? Obviously you're still... Oh, shut up, you insufferable clown, yelled Mr. Fisk, backhanding Mr. White with such force that he was knocked off his feet and hurled nearly eight feet, violently slamming headfirst into a wall. Mr. White crumbled to the floor, eyes open in shock, blood dripping from his mouth, and neck bent in an unnatural angle. Mr. J, screamed Miss Quinn, tears running down her face. She ran to his broken body, kneeling next to him, but terrified to cradle his head lest his neck had been broken. Oh, Mr. J, Pookie Pie, I promise I'll take back all those bad things I said about you. Just be okay, my love, just be okay. Oh, Mr. J. The white ghost looked impassively on as Miss Quinn broke down into babbling hysterics, disgust growing even more in his heart. Whatever his name was, Poole, Wilson, Spectre, he accomplished what you set him out to do. He managed to kill the black bat, but I've taken his place. What are you saying, Mr. Wayne? Fisk curled his hands into fists. His tone was slow steady and low, but tinged with fear. I'm saying that I'm giving you a little time to pay his estate the twenty million that you owe. Do it or not, I don't care. But after that time is up, I'm coming. First, I'm coming to kill your associates. Then, I'm coming to kill your family. And then finally, I'll be coming to kill you. Does that... Does that include me too? Miss Quinn looked up shuddering in terror at the realization that the once noble and honorable man with the black horns was truly gone, replaced by a monster with nothing but hate behind pale blue eyes. If you're lucky, said the white ghost, I'll kill you last. The heavy oaken double doors to the office burst open, and a dozen heavily armed men wearing black tactical uniforms piled inside. Fisk turned briefly and pointing a fat finger at the window, yelled, Get him! Get him! Fire before it!" But the ledge 
was already empty, the wind howling through the broken window pane. Quinn, the old Fisk, genuine fear in his voice. Cease your insipid babbling and get me Mr. Castle on the phone quickly. Epilogue Richard could hardly believe it. In the two months since the death of Mr. J. White, no less than 16 of New York's most notorious superpower criminals, mercenaries, hitmen, assassins, and bodyguards had been found brutally murdered, many of them discovered, disemboweled, and beheaded. Police reports said that the killer was likely one person, and who that person was still remained a mystery. This brutal murderer is the same person also suspected of crucifying the wife and six-year-old adopted daughter of prominent New York lawyer, Mr. W. Fisk. The papers reported that Mr. Fisk returned to his estate to find all ten of his security guards, led by a prominent hired gun named Mr. Castle, gutted like fish. In the master bedroom, Fisk found the bloody bodies of his wife and daughter nailed to a stone monument shaped like a crescent moon. Well, this discovery sent Mr. Fisk into a psychological breakdown and, now under police protection, was in a state of catatonic shock. For his part, Richard didn't have time to dwell on the concerns plaguing the criminal underworld of New York City. He was having his own issues dealing with the rise of crime in the Gothic City, now that the Black Bat was presumed killed. Richard knew the Black Bat. The man who was the Black Bat had been his guardian, his mentor, his trainer, his friend and father figure ever since Richard was a child. Even when they'd had a falling out and Richard had left to start his own life of fighting injustice, he still loved and respected Bruce, who had indeed bankrolled almost all of his crime-fighting ventures. Richard knew that the man they found with the broken neck wearing the Black Bat's battle suit wasn't the real Black Bat. So where did he go? He received the unbelievable answer when the Black Bat's former lover, Miss Quinn, who was on the rebound after being dumped by Mr. J, called him last night. Sobbing, she was terrified and in hiding somewhere in New York City. Richard couldn't believe what she was saying, but it made sense in some sort of sick way. The new white ghost was going to kill Mr. Fisk and, once he was dead, would be coming after Quinn. He didn't want to believe it was true, but if it was, then Richard would have to put a stop to the closest thing he'd ever had to a father. He'd have to put an end to a living legend. The line moved fairly quickly as the passengers were boarded on the short 45-minute flight from the Gothic city in New Jersey to LaGuardia Airport. The young flight attendant scanned Richard's tickets before handing it back to him with a smile. Have a nice flight, Mr. Grayson. As the young man in his late twenties boarded the claustrophobic plane, he inadvertently bumped into another person. Turning to apologize, Richard immediately recognized the spectacled young woman with the flowing red hair. Barbara, he said. I thought I told you to stay here. It's too dangerous to go after him. Wrong, Dick, replied Barbara, a young woman in her early twenties. Why don't you stay and help clean up the mess that was left behind with your protégés of super-powered teenage titans? Be reasonable, Barbara, said Richard, lowering his voice as people crowded around him to stow their carry-on in the cramped overhead compartments. That's not him anymore. Bruce's... Shut up, Dick, she snapped, sounding more anguished than angry. I know that he's gone, but I have the suit. I'm taking it to Stark to modify it to fit me. Maybe you can make it a super suit like you did for the kid with the spider powers. The white ghost killed Parker, replied Richard. Oh, you never knew when to keep your trap shut, did you, little bird? Barbara knew that Dick hated being called little bird. That's probably why the bat kicked your ass to the curb. Now sit down and shut the hell up. If you insist on coming, you can be my sidekick if you like. But if anyone is going to take down the white ghost, it's damn well going to be the new black bat. Well, my dear friends, I hope you think as I do that that was a worthy sequel to The Man in Black. Uh, it takes the story forward um, in intriguing different ways, and, well, it sounds like it's nowhere near finished yet, doesn't it? 
Yep, hope you enjoyed that one just as much as the first episode. That one really did have you intrigued a couple of weeks ago. So yeah, I had to immediately get on this one as well. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's it for this evening's entertainment. Back again very soon, my dear friends, of course. Till the next time, very, very sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.